but you'll have to adjust that. Good evening. Phew, I'm going to sit down and take a break. It wore me out. So we are doing something tonight, and uh, I hope this is not a failure. But I tested it earlier today, and it was working fabulous. Is that a word, fab fabulous? So we uh, are live feed to Facebook, to YouTube, and our phone system all in one thing. And so we're hoping the volume is good. We're praying the video is good. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, crank the house up. That'll get them. All right, now can you hear me? All right. But anyway, I hope the volume is good on all platforms. And we are going to continue on in our study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've got a huge prayer list, so... I'm going to try to stop a little bit early so we can spend some time in prayer tonight. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, let me say we've got a couple of visitors with us again tonight. Uh, if this is, Kendra, not to embarrass you, but if this is your first Wednesday, things are a little bit different. We just go through a book of the Bible. We're in 1 Corinthians tonight. So it's very laid back um, if you've got input. Feel free to jump in, correct me, add to it, uh, whatever you need to do, and uh, I believe God will bless it. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into God's Word. Lord, we come to you once again, just uh, humbled by your presence in this place today, God. So many families in our community and our church that are hurting, uh, God, we pray that you would touch them, that you would continue to heal the sick. Lord, we pray that your presence would be felt all over this campus tonight. We pray as they open your word in the Bible in action that you'd give Andrew just the words to say, uh, give him clarity to speak to those children. Pray that you would give them uh, ears to listen and patience to be quiet. Uh, we pray for our youth. Oh, what a blessing it is to see so many familiar faces tonight that have not been uh, with us in a little while. God, we're so thankful that they came tonight. And Lord, we're so thankful for every visitor and every new youth, every new adult that's here tonight. Pray that you would bless. And I pray that as we leave here, it would not be a waste of time, but we could say it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, Lord, we need you as we open your word. Again, we beg and ask for clarity uh, and understanding. We ask that the Spirit would speak to us tonight. And uh, as we draw a close and we look at our prayer list tonight, God, you know every need that we're going to mention tonight. You'll know those needs that's not even mentioned, that we're not aware of. I'm thankful that you are a God that knows, uh, knows everything about us, the good and bad. God, there may be somebody that it was just a struggle for them to even get here tonight. Maybe they were on the fence on whether they wanted to come. Again, I pray that you would speak to them, encourage them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, um, I hope to get through this tonight. God has put something in my heart uh, that I want to try to give you. And one of the prayers that I always have is, God, let me give it to them like you give it to me. And I know sometimes that, that don't come out like that. You know, sometimes... My words are not right, and there's just not a way that I can tell you what God put into my heart. But I want to try to tonight. Uh, again, what I do when I sit down and I start going through these books is the first thing I do is look who he's talking to, right? I try to get in the context. Number two, I ask God to show me what he wants me to know out of it. What does he want me to see? And then I start to outline it. Uh, when I outline, you, you all have heard me preach enough, 
uh, I start looking at the general thoughts, start looking at some things that jump off the pages. And when, when God gives me that, uh, then I start trying to build, I guess, the study around it. What's God saying? Look at different commentaries and stuff. And the first thing that I saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you're taking notes, was the immaturity of the church. The immaturity of the church. You say, what are you talking about, Tony? We mentioned this last week, but look at verse, or chapter 3 and verse 1. I, brethren, notice what he says here. I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Can you imagine what Paul might have wanted to say to them if he thought that they were mature in their faith and could have handled the truth? But here he's saying this, I couldn't speak to you spiritually. I had to speak to you as babes, as carnal. Uh, what does that mean? I think it means worldly. Because remember, they, they smelled and tasted and looked like the world. The church of Corinth, I mean, you couldn't tell them apart. They, they, they dabbled in the world. But then they come together and try to worship. Does that not look like the church of 2020? Again, as so many churches, anything goes, hey, I'm all about come as you are, but I'm more about and leave changed. Amen? I mean, we should still be set apart, and I believe there's nothing wrong with that. Look at verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with, what's it say? Meat. Again, I used last week that illustration of little Laney and her bottle. Um, I know, you, anybody tired of hearing about my goats? They're teaching me lessons every day. Melly has been off the bottle now for about three weeks, I guess, something like that. Mabel is still on the bottle. And this, this I don't know what it is, I'm going to call it junk. It's some kind of powder, it's a formula, and... It don't smell good, and I'm sure it don't taste good. But when you take it out there to that goat pen and you hold it down, Melly does all that she can to get that bottle away from Mabel. And what I think about that this morning even, when I took it out there, I thought, this woman loves the taste of this milk. This little goat loves that. But then I started thinking about the church house, how many have never matured past just the milk of the Word. I, I mean, you know who Jesus is, and you probably even know those Sunday school, Bible school lessons, but you really don't understand who God is. You don't understand His nature. Maybe you don't even understand a lot of the doctrine because you haven't dug into the meat of the Word. And here's he saying this, I fed you with milk because I don't think you were ready for, for the meat. Kurt, you'll remember this. Back when I first went to Bethel, I had a very vivid dream. And some of you are going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this. I, I don't think I'm crazy. Well, maybe. But anyway, it was a dream that we as a whole church, we had started to grow. And I could even see some faces that I knew but we were standing on the bank of a river. We were standing on, on a body of water, let me put it like that. But we were on the bank. And in this dream, I, had, I, had a, I wanted to go out. I wanted to get out with them. But you know what they said in that dream, what God showed me in that dream? He kept saying this, you can't go deep yet, they're not ready. But what is that about? And the more that I learned who the church was and the more I learned who I was pastoring, this is not bad toward them, but praise God, we had a lot of new Christians in there that had just recently been saved. And I think what God was trying to tell me is you've got to build a foundation before you can go deep with them. You've got to understand who they are in Christ, right? And so when Paul's talking here, and we're going to get into a foundation in just a minute, here's what he's saying. He says, I've got to give you the foundation first. And that's why so many people get saved and then they get gone. Because they don't, number one, understand who they are in Christ, right? And so you say, hey, you're saved. You've got a relationship with Christ. And then they turn around and Satan climbs on their back and they fail in their sin. And you know what they do? Well, I'm not good enough for this. And so they just walk away. 
But as a church, not just First Baptist, I'm saying as a church, y'all have heard me preach about this, what is the number one failure in the church? Somebody help me. Discipleship. It ain't that we don't evangelize. It's not that we don't give them enough gospel to get them saved. The Spirit of God draws that, right? But then they don't know what to do with it. Well, I'm going to encourage you right now. We've got some Sunday school teachers in the room. Some of the best discipleship that you'll ever get is getting plugged into a Sunday school class. And that's where you learn, you're going to learn more in a Sunday school class than I can give you on a Sunday morning. You say, why is that? You're the pastor. Yeah, I have three people. Have y'all ever heard the three people that I pray for every week? You're about to hear it tonight. Mama's probably heard this many times. Three people I pray for every week. You say, who's those three people, Tony? Number one is the loss that walks in this place. I beg God every week for me to be able to present the gospel in a way that that lost person who has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ would understand enough that there was a God in heaven who loved them enough to die for their sins. Amen? Ain't you glad that some preacher preached that enough to you? Number two, the person I pray for is that new Christian. Or maybe that Christian who grew up in church, knows the Sunday school lessons, the Bible school lessons, But then when they got older, they got out of church. And when they come back in, they're like babes in Christ. They they don't know. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to be a Christian. They don't know how to fight Satan when he comes against their family. And so that's the number two person I pray for. God, let me give them enough to grab them by the hand and walk with them and disciple them, right? And then number three. This person is the hardest person to minister to in this church. It's the one that's always done it. It's the one that knows this Bible better than I do. It's the one who teaches Sunday school. It's the one that if you've got a question, that's the one you call. Y'all are like thinking, who's he talking about? I don't know who I'm talking about, but my prayer is, God, let me give that one something that they can grow with as well. And when they leave here, they're not saying, well, that preacher didn't give me nothing. God's Word is good no matter if you're just fresh or no matter if you know it all. You can hear the same stories over and over and over. But when the Spirit of God falls and gives you something new, it's pretty refreshing, ain't it? Hey, I I don't want to uh, call y'all out, but would they want to go to the children's program? Kurt, would you walk him over to Andrew? They would absolutely love it. Sorry about that. They, they will love it. Um, and so anyway, when the Spirit of God falls upon them, you learn something new, right? And so every time that we come into God's house, here's the way I look at it. The preacher can preach, but if I'm not ready to receive it, Chances are I'm not going to get anything out of it. So as much as I'm praying for you, I'm begging you to ask God to give you something from me. And when you do that, the Bible says you seek me, you will find me. There may be a nugget. I may preach on pure salvation, but there's a little nugget that God would use that you ain't heard or maybe that you forgot, maybe that you would encourage. But look, the immaturity. He says you... I fed you with milk and not with meat. You were not able, (laughs) I love this, to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy, strive, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So what does he judge them by being immature in their faith? Anybody? Anybody? They have divisions amongst them, right? Now, here's the thing. We might not all agree on what this thing says, right? We might all, again, if I was to ask everybody's point of view eschatology, I guarantee you somebody in here would not think like me, and I probably wouldn't think like you. 
But I do think this, that we should be able to love each other enough that we can still worship together. As long as we can agree that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, I believe that we can get along good enough to work together. Amen? But there are some churches, there are, I'm not preaching against that, I'm just saying there's some people who are so bullheaded that people are going to hell while the church members are fighting with each other. They're trying to pump their chest and blow their self up on who knows more while the, <laughs> while the number one lost person is in the church and there's so much division and so much fighting that the lost person is not hearing the gospel while everybody else is fighting. Paul says you wasn't even ready for the meat and you couldn't even handle it. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says this, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. What is some milk? I want to give you some just real quick and we'll move on. I'm not going to stay here long. The milk. Number one is we all have a past. You ready? Some milk that we could eat on tonight is every single person in these pews have a past. My past might be different from yours. You may have been grown up in church. You may have never been in church. But we were all sinners, and that was our past. Amen? We all have a present. What do you mean, Tony? Well, when God comes into your life, He changes your life. But how many do you know, and maybe you might be like this today, how many does your past keep you held down? We talked about this Sunday. People can't get past decisions. People can't get past failures. And they allow their past to affect their present. Right? But when God comes into your life, He says this, If any man be in Christ, he's a new Creature, the old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. I've heard this said before, and I've preached it in funerals. It's not really how you start. It's how you finish. So tonight could be a new start for you. You could be here and you say, you know what? I look back, and I'm not really happy with how my life's been going. Well, can I tell you, you came to the right place. There's a man named Jesus that if you let him in, he could change your present. Everybody has a past. Everybody's got a present. But here's the reality. You ready? Everybody's got a future. Everybody's got a future. The future we've got to look at is this. Not, our, not where we're going to college. Not what kind of job. Not what kind of car. The future that you better have nailed down right now at this moment is this. If God took you Right here at this intersection at A.J. Highway and Old Dandridge Pike, where would you open your eyes in eternity? That's, that's the number one future. And then once you get that nailed down, you can ask God, okay, what do you have for my life? What do you have for the calling of my life? What is it? What's my purpose in this world? But there's so many people that's looking for the purpose, but they don't have their eternity nailed down. The only thing that you should know for sure is this. I don't know what's going to happen today. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. I don't know what's going to happen in the morning. But I do know this, that no matter what happens, I'm signed, I'm sealed, and I'm saved. Amen? That's what the foundation of the gospel is. If you don't know that, you'll never know anything else. And you'll never do anything else. Hebrews 5.12 says this. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong milk or strong meat. I believe what that verse is saying, and I've looked at that so many times, is this. Sometimes we need to get back to the basic. Can I tell you this? You can know every scripture. You can name the Bibles front and back. You could serve in every position. But if you have lost the joy of your salvation, as David says it, what good is that that you know? Some of the most miserable people I know have been Christians their whole life. Why are they so miserable? I believe it's this, because they have forgot that God brought them from their past, gave them a new future, or present, and now He can do something with their future. God can change you tonight. 
Let's, look, let's move on. Number two, let's look at the increase. Look at the increase. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? They're just ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Basically, he's saying this. Apollos really ain't nothing. I, Paul, ain't nothing. They are just people who preach to you Christ. But the increase, notice this in verse 6. I've planted, Apollos watered, but who gave the increase? God. Ain't you thankful for that? See, here's the, what we've got to understand. That with our future, nowhere in this Bible will you find this, that you're responsible for the results. And as a pastor, <laughs> I've got to understand that. It ain't my job to grow this church. It ain't my job to uh, get people saved. I couldn't save somebody if I wanted to. But it is my job to be faithful to plant the seeds. It's our job as a church to be faithful to water those seeds. And praise God, we've got a faithful God who gives the increase. And when He gives that increase and we're faithful to do what we do, can I tell you this? God's faithful to do what He does. And with that comes church growth. With that comes people being saved. With that comes money in the bank. I mean, I'm not talking, I'm not preaching tithing. I'm just telling you this. When we do what God's called us to do, God does what He does, and everything works together for the good. Amen? You say, Tony, we're going to cancel church in March. They ain't one person going to come to this church in March. And we're going to keep it like that for three to four months. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wring my hands a little bit. I'm going to say, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. If we do that, all of our missions, all of our ministries, everything's going to just go, right? That's the kernel of it. But you know what's happened over the last four or five months? God has saved through the internet. People are still coming. And when we open this thing up, the first people that I thought I would never see again are the people who have recently been saved. Oh, what little faith this pastor has. You know who the first people were at the door to come through? Those people who had recently been saved. Hey, I'm telling you, when God changes you, He changes you, right? Look at verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We're not against each other. We're throwing the seeds. Another one comes by and says, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. Where, where do you go church? Oh, we go over at First Baptist. I'd love to have you. That's a seed that's been planted. That's a little water that's been thrown on. Somebody else comes by and says, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. Where do you go? Over at First Baptist. A little bit more water throws on you. Hey, I, will you go church anywhere? No, but people's been inviting me. Where to? Over at First Baptist. Again, a little bit of water thrown on it. They finally make their way in here. Oh, I love it when this happens. They think they're just coming to get you off their back. But then the Holy Ghost of God comes in and He gives that great big increase. And before you know it, you see them step out come and they get saved. Then they go home and they tell their family about it and it, God just changes the whole family. Then you see a whole family in church. You know what I love to see? Over there in that youth. Them youth get right. They ride that van home. They tell mom and dad, you won't believe. There's a God in heaven who loved me, took my sins away. I'm going to get baptized. Won't you come watch me? Oh, I love this right here now. Mom and Daddy, Mama, Papa all come to watch their grandbaby get baptized. <laughs> Next thing you know, the God of heaven gives a big increase and dumps on them. They get out of their seat. They get right. Guess what? Now there's a new Mama. There's a new Papa. There's a new Mom. There's a new Dad. There's a new family. The increase. Can I say it like this? Without God in this place, nothing can be accomplished. Now let me say this, because that sounds horrid, don't it? With God, nothing shall be impossible. 
Amen. The increase. Look at verse 9. For we are laborers together with God, and you are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Again, let me just put it like this. What is the foundation of every building that we should do, every mission that we should do, every ministry that we should do here? What is the foundation? Okay, let me re-ask that question in a different way. Y'all ready? It's not what is the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. It's who is the foundation, right? No program should be built on me. No program should be built on Harry. No program should be built on Pastor Wesley or Andrew. The program should be built on the marvelous grace of God through Jesus Christ. And if we keep Him the foundation, what happens? Oh, it's strong, ain't it? Remember Remember the parable of the two builders? One built on sand, and the storm came, and it said mighty, right? I think I'm saying this right. Mighty was the fall, right? Great was the fall. But then you had that builder who says, you know what? We need to make sure that foundation is right. And when that storm comes, and the wind blows, and the rain falls, guess what? Ain't nothing can tear it down. That's the kind of church I want here. That's what I want. Look, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he build thereon. Oh, man. Verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid which is in Jesus Christ. And then verse 12, something changes. I've told you about the immaturity. I've told you about the increase. I want to spend a little time and talk to you about the inspection. You're you're an electrician by trade, right? You ever had somebody come behind you and inspect your work and almost give you a seal of approval, right? I've had people come by. I worked at Sea Ray for many years, and I worked in what they called final finish. So the boat would go through the process, and then we would be the last person that would touch that boat before it went to the dealer. We would repair any imperfections, we'd clean that boat up, we'd put the decals on, and then there would be a man that would come, (laughs) I didn't like him at the time, but he would come with a light, and he would begin to inspect our work. He would take a red marker, it was a uh, grease pencil, I think is what they called it, it's been many years. But anyway, he'd start writing on the side of that boat. Man, I'd sit back there and watch him. I think it's 3 o'clock on a Friday, and here you are marking that boat up. Oh, man. How can I put this that you'll grasp it and you'll understand it? There is a God in heaven who is inspecting every single thing that we do as Christians. See, there's two different judgments. And I I don't have time to get deep into this tonight, but I do want to hit it enough that you understand this. There's two different judgments. The Bible says that every single person will go through a judgment. Look look, look at uh, 2 Corinthians real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 says this, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. Notice what the Bible says. Whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now, has anybody been inspected in their job? Has anybody had an evaluation in their job? (laughs) Can I tell you something what I thought about this week? I don't know what time it is. I won't try to go on a rabbit trail. But... This was my first year pastoring full-time, okay? This, in a sense, I don't want to say this because I don't like how it sounds, but this is my job, right? I mean, the church pays me to come here and to minister and to preach, and so this past year, our co- or our chairman, deacon of the chairman said, uh, we've set up a committee and you're going to have to be evaluated, 
What? I mean, for 13 years, I flew on the helicopter, and I got an evaluation every year, Kurt. We'd have to go into the sim lab, and we would have to do skills, and I'd have to intubate and start IVs and make sure I was doing all my skills right, and that didn't bother me. But this year, they said, hey, you're going to have to be evaluated. Well, who's going to evaluate me? Well, there'll be a group of deacons that write a report on you, and You'll sit down with them and you'll discuss how you're doing. I was nervous. Like biting my fingernail nervous, okay? But then I thought this. At the end of the day, I don't answer to them deacons. And at the end of the day, it don't really matter what you think. Because at the end of the day, I read this, that every single person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer to everything I've done. You say, does that include every Christian? Can I tell you this? It includes every Christian. The two judgments that you'll go through is either as a lost person or a saved person. The saved person goes through this judgment that they're talking about in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, the judgment seat of Christ. And can I say this? That is not whether you're getting to heaven or not, okay? It's been settled by the blood of Jesus Christ. If your name's in the Lamb's book of life, you're getting to heaven, but it might not be with rewards. Now, if you're here and you're lost this more, or this afternoon, I've got to tell you this. You too will stand before Jesus Christ. And you will stand before Him not as a merciful, loving God. You will stand before Him as a judge who will look at your life. And the Bible, if you want to turn there, is in Revelation chapter 20. It talks about them opening, I'm paraphrasing, is that okay? Them taking the books and opening the books. Here's what I believe. It's my life, well, not mine because I ain't going to be there. But it's that lost person's life from the time they're born till the time they die. And I believe it's this. It's every time that they say, correct me if I'm wrong, but here's what I'm thinking. When we begin to look at that book and they open those books, I believe that he will tell you, do you remember when you sat on that Wednesday night at First Baptist of Strawberry Plains and you knew that you were lost without Jesus Christ, but you put it off and you put it off? Do you remember that night? I believe that maybe, you know, there will be some that say, I do remember that night, but you don't know what was on my mind. You do, I do remember that night. And I remember that he preached on the judgment. But do you know what I was facing the next day? And then he'll go over into the corner. And he'll pull out, I I, I don't know what it looks like. I believe it's a big book. And he'll say, give me one, one second. And he'll begin to flip that page. And as he takes his big finger and he runs it up and down that page, he'll say this, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You say, what? If you're here and you're saved... Praise God, you're just going to go before him and he's going to judge your intent of work. He's going to judge your dedication to your work. He's going to to judge your faithfulness to your work. And he's going to give you rewards. Now, I do believe this, that he's going to say, Tony, you remember when I put that guy in your path and you sidestepped him at the store? Man, if you could only seen what would have happened to his life if you would have spoke Christ to him that day. And I believe that. I believe that he will call those things. And I won't get the rewards that I should get if I remain faithful to him. But I'll tell you this. I'd much rather stand at the judgment seat of Christ and get my rewards than stand at the great white throne judgment to see if my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. 
I'm not getting anywhere where I wanted to tonight. Is that okay? But I've got to tell you this. Well, I'm going somewhere. It was in March of 2012. I received a phone call from Rico, the orphanage director, and some of y'all may have heard this. I don't know if you did. You're just going to have to hear it again. He said, I need you to get to Haiti. I need you to come here. There is a problem with your fall. I don't know if Tony's coming home. And the real re reality of this was this. He was my son. On paper, he was a haze. On paper, the adoption was finalized. But if you don't know anything about international adoption, it can be finalized in Haiti, but then the file is hand-delivered to the U.S. Embassy. And if you don't have a Haitian passport and you don't have a visa, guess what? <laughs> you're, a, you're a daddy to a kid that's living in Haiti and he ain't coming here. Rico said, I don't know what we're going to do. I need you to come here. I could hear it in his voice. He was scared. He didn't know what was happening. Here's what I did. I went to the bank, and I got money, and I got on that jet plane, and I went to Haiti. They picked me up at the airport, immediately took me over to Jock Mail. I'll never forget this as long as I live. We walk into that court in Jock Mail. It was a little wooden building. Books everywhere. I mean, I don't even know how they keep up with this. For those that don't know, I delivered Tony. I was there. You could not convince me that he was born. I was there. I held him. I watched him come out. I've got it on my phone if you want to watch it. I knew the day. I knew the time. There was nobody that could convince me that he was not born. I had a copy of a birth certificate in my hand. And in the top right corner of this birth certificate, I don't remember the letter, so bear with me. I think it was C3. Didn't mean anything to me. Probably don't mean a thing to you either. But this judge took this birth certificate that I had in my hand, and him and Rico began to communicate back and forth in Creole. He looked at that number, and he went over into a big stack of books sitting over in the corner. Granted, their file system is not great. He pulled out a spiral-bound notebook. Notebook paper is what it was. This judge took this book and began to flip in the page. He reached out in that book and he pointed. You know what was written in that book? Say it louder. Nothing was written in that book. Rico said, this is not good. I said, but I've got the birth certificate. Rico begins to talk to him. I said, Rico, how much money would it take? Right? I mean, hey, it's Haiti. Rico says, no, you don't understand. There's nothing we can do here. What had happened was when he was born and they issued that certificate, somebody did not record his name on that notebook paper. We got in the car, and it was the longest ride that I've ever had from Jacques Mel to Port-au-Prince across that mountain. I was upset. I was mad. I was defeated. And then all of a sudden, Rico's driving, and he looks over and he says this, I know what we'll do. We'll have him reborn. I'm like, what? We went straight to a courthouse down in Port-au-Prince, and a man came out. He handed him the birth certificate. They talked in Creole, and the man said, yes, just a couple of weeks. Man, my heart was like, okay, this sounds good, but I don't know, is this even legal? I got on that plane, I came back, left everything there, trusting God, that God would do what he says. As we're going back home, I get home, I tell Leanne I'm not for sure what's going to happen, but here's what I was told. Within two weeks, we would have it. 
Friends, I'm going to skip some of the story, but I want to tell you this. Within two weeks, I got a phone call. And here's what I was told. Tony, it's been certified. We've got your passport. Your file will be going to the U.S. Embassy soon. Your son's going to be coming home. Some of you are looking at me like, what does that story even have to do? I believe that God allowed me and Leanne and her family to go through that trial so I could stand here and tell you this. I've lived it. There's no... There's nothing that will ever compare to that judge looking at me and telling me that that page was empty and that my son was not registered. Mama, Daddy, maybe you're that one right now. Can I tell you this? At that great white throne judgment, it don't matter if you know (laughs) that your son was a good person, your wife was a good person, that you were a good person. It don't matter how much money you have. There's not a thing that you can do to get your son, your daughter, yourself from here to there except just as Rico says, you must be born again. John 3, 3, born again. You must have your name written in the Lamb's book of life before you'll ever get your traveling papers to heaven. Once his name was recorded in that book, they signed off. Long story short is he's here now, amen. What did it take to get there? It took a son. It took a father, actually, to send a son here to pay an ultimate price to get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I say this, I don't know why I'm saying this tonight. Everybody's saved on a Wednesday night, right? But maybe somebody ain't saved that's watching or listening All I can tell you is this, it's not based on works. It's not based on money. It's not based on your good looks. The only thing that matters when all this is over is that you did what God called you to do, and that's to come to Him. Christian, as you stand before this great, or this uh, judgment seat of Christ, Verse 12 says, If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone. But then it says, Wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he has built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye I ask you this as we get into our prayer list tonight. If you stood before God right now, would you stand as a saved person or would you stand as a lost person? Number two, if you stood before God right now and you laid all of your work down before Him, would it burn up? Or would it stand the test of time? God, thank you for your word tonight. Pray that you'd bless it. Pray that you'd speak. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to go into our prayer list tonight. If you're visiting with us, we just go through and spend a little time on the altar. But uh, Bobby Hart, he's still at UT. How many has prayed for Bobby and his cancer? Can I tell you, Rebecca said that they came to her and said, Bobby's cancer is in remission. Hey, hey, he's gone from hospice, I'm going to say it like this, from hospice to healed. Literally, couldn't do anything else. And Rebecca said, they've said, hey, the cancer ain't his problem. Once he recovers from his surgery, he's good to go. I'm thanking God for that, amen. Jamie Ferguson has been moved to, uh, I believe it's Select Specialty Hospital at Fort Sanders. She's still not waking up, 
Uh, so that gives them some time to make decisions, but just know that that family still needs a miracle straight from heaven. Uh, there was a bad wreck. I believe it was over in Kodak. Dawson Satterfield and Allie Bernard was in that. Uh, Dawson has been uh, discharged from the hospital, but Allie is still hurt really bad. And their family really, again, needs heaven to open up and a miracle to be sent down. Uh, Ricky Kate, he's a 35-year-old that needs a uh, liver transplant. And he's family to many of our members. He needs a touch from God. Ronnie Luttrell was scheduled to have surgery uh, earlier in the week. His blood pressure was high, and I think they're going to do that on July the 7th, I believe. Uh, we've had some death in our family. Uh, Steve Kate's mom, Miss Ann, died, and they'll be doing the graveside service tomorrow at 1 o'clock over at Piney. Uh, Karen Thomas, who was saved a few weeks ago, she died uh, last night. They're doing the funeral tonight and tomorrow. And then uh, a, a guy that we've been associated with for many years, and I want to say this, his hand is, is intertwined all in my ministry. His name's Ben Franklin. Uh, he died last night as well. I'll be preaching the funeral on Friday for, for him. Uh, our cancer list, uh, please correct me if I've left any off. Sarah, uh, Cheryl, uh, Elaine Palmer's brother, and then Ricky Brooks and Mike Stennett are actively in treatment and, and going through that. Uh, Lake and Luttrell still needs answers, still needs God to touch her. Uh, surgery, Ann Taylor's recovering, Pastor Sam's recovering, Mike Davis is recovering, and then uh, Christy goes for a heart cath next Monday, right? The 29th, your mama? I think so. That's Oh, sorry. Uh, but I think that's what I got on my list. I hope I was. Well, that's awkward. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, please do. Tell her we're praying for her. Uh, I think that's the 29th. So, and then I want to say this. Please, please pray for our country. Uh, our country, our law enforcement, EMS, military, uh, our leaders. Amen. I don't care if you're left or right, blue or red. I believe God instructs us to pray for those in leadership, and right now our country needs unification instead of division. Amen. Uh, Alan Cloninger still at Host and Healthcare. Any others tonight before we get on this altar and pray? Next weekend? All right, very good. I don't have a pen. I'll make a note of that. Any others? Barbara. Yes, Miss Barbara Cooper. Yeah, thank you. Oh. And then I've got to say this. Um, I had a meeting before church with some of the nursery workers. And by January, if our count is right, we will have eight, <laughs> let me say that again, eight new additions in this church. Eight babies. Pray for them. Pray for the mamas and the daddies and these babies and pray what God's doing here in this place. Amen. Let's get on this altar and pray. I hope you've been blessed tonight. If you're watching via Facebook, YouTube, or listening on the phone, we miss you. We love you. Pray that God would speak to you. And I want to say this. Maybe you're here and you've never been saved. It's as easy as believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. Lord... Thank you so, so much for just another incredible service. God, I pray that their hearts have been as filled as mine. I'm thankful that one day I will stand before you. But God, I won't stand before you as a lost man. I'm going to stand before you as one that's been washed, redeemed, saved by the blood of the Lamb. And God, I pray that as I lay my work before you, God, that it will stand the test of time. And I pray that this would change us, God, that we would be more aware of what we're doing and those that you put in our path. God, I pray if there's a lost person listening tonight that they would understand that once they stand there at that great white throne judgment that it's too late to be saved then. God, I pray that they would run to an altar before it's everlasting too late and call out your name. God, we pray for these ones who we've lifted up tonight, these ones that are fighting cancer, these ones that are hurting from a death of a loved one. 
Lord, we pray for our country, pray for our leaders, pray for our president, our senate, our congress. God, I pray that you would send some Bible-believing men, women, that would lead this country with conviction as, as the holy word, as a road map. I believe that the church, if they would just turn from their wicked ways, is what you said, that you would hear from heaven, you would heal our land. God, if we've ever needed healing, we, we need it now. Lord, again, I pray that you'd bless every person. I pray that you'd bless every child, every youth, every person watching. I pray that you'd bless our efforts. God, you've not called us to, to, to look at the results, but you did call us to be faithful, to be intentional. God, I pray that we would be found that. Again, I love you, and I'm so thankful for what you've done, what you're going to do. We give you all honor, all glory, for you are worthy of our praise tonight. God, it's with one voice, one mind, one accord that the church says, Amen. Thank you for coming. God bless you.